It's a moment, I think you're muted. Uh, Mons, uh, how is this? Yes, yes, much better. So, did you miss my whole introduction? <laughs> I'm afraid so. <laughs> okay, so let me just start again and just say thanks to Asset and thanks to Tom Gilbert for the invitation. And hi, everyone. So, like uh, Asset said last year, I had the great pleasure of winning the animal portraits category of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition with this image of a proboscis monkey. And this was the culmination of an ongoing photo project of mine focusing on primates. So the last six years, I've taken around 40,000 portraits of 10 different species of primates in Africa and Asia. And today I'm gonna talk about this wildlife photography project and uh, talk about why it is primates that I find so interesting. But let me start out with um, talking a bit about my background as a wildlife biologist and mammal researcher, because this is actually something that also has a big influence on my approach to wildlife photography and wildlife communication. So let's start out by taking you to the Amazon. And here comes a much younger version of yours truly during half a year of field work in the Rio Madre Dios region of the Peruvian Amazon. The aim of this study was to investigate this phenomena called mineral licks, which is places where vegetarian mammals, they come to, a, to eat clay to obtain certain minerals. And we wanted to figure out what animals use the licks in the Amazon and especially what minerals that they are gaining by eating the clay. That's why we're taking soil samples here. And I just wanted to include this video to show you that I have a background as what I call a muddy boots biologist. Uh, uh, Mons, while it's going, can I, can I ask you to remove maybe the top bar? Uh, th there is a gray bar on top of the video, uh, slightly obscuring the top parts of... I don't know how to do that, Asha. Um, okay, I mean, it's not a big chunk anyway, so it's, it's okay, but yeah. Right, so the South American wilderness has played a big part of my life. I've spent several years doing mammal research in the Amazon, the Pantanal, and the Brazilian Cerrado savanna, and I was specialized in doing mammal surveys, and one of the methods that I used was camera trapping. I was actually the first one to use camera trapping for mammal research in South America. And here are some of the elusive species that I was able to record with the camera traps. Jaguar, giant armadillo, puma, tapir, and ocelot. At my first field site in Pantanal, I got more than 50 camera trap photos of ocelot. And I realized that it was actually possible to tell them apart from their spots and stripes. And this opened up a whole new exciting possibility that of estimating the density of the ocelots in the study area. And I use this method also for two other species, tapir and maned wolf. The most Exciting photo that I got with my camera traps was this one from one of the mineral leaks that I was monitoring in the Peruvian Amazon. This is a tiny deer called dwarf rocket. And immediately when I saw this photo, I had a gut feeling that it was something special. And it turned out to be the first record of dwarf rocket in all of the Amazon. It was a new species to Peru, and it was most likely a new species to science altogether. So after having spent a total of five years in South America, I felt ready to begin a whole new chapter of my life. And I decided to leave research and instead work full time with another area that I've always been passionate about, which is public engagement and science communication. 
Prior to this, I'd worked at the Copenhagen Zoo for seven years with public engagement. And one of the things that I really appreciate about public engagement is that it allows you to reach a big audience and educate the broad public and hopefully make them think that the topics that you're talking about are interesting and important. One of the things that I wanted to do was to write books about animals. And here are three of the six books I've published. Guides to the Wildlife of Africa, the Galapagos Islands in Greenland. And then 13 years ago, I got my current job at the Natural History Museum, where I get to work with science communication in a much broader way. So at this time when I went from science to public engagement, that's also when I started becoming really serious about my wildlife photography. And I started traveling all over the world to photograph wildlife. South America, Finland, Antarctica, India, China. Now in 2014, I traveled to the Simi Mountains of Ethiopia. And this was a trip that came to totally change my photographic direction. I went there to photograph one animal in particular, namely this guy here, the Jalaba. The Jalalas live in some of the largest and most complex societies of any mammals. They occur in groups, sometimes numbering more than a thousand individuals, and they have incredible facial expressions. Always these intense eyes, even the young ones. And they have all this really amazing facial expression that you only find in the Jalala. I'll show that to you here they're able to pull back their upper lip and it kind of looks like an alien in the movie shooting out its jaws. And they do this to flash to show off these huge canines that they have framed in pink to show the neighborhood that they are strong and not to be messed with. So I spent a week in the company of the Jalanas and they totally blew my mind. At this point, I'd been focusing on taking portraits of wildlife for about a year and a half, and I've taken portraits of many different animals, but the gelada made me realize that when we're talking about facial expressions, there's just nothing that comes even close to the primates. So that's when I decided to focus on, on our closest relatives, on the primates. And over the next half decade, I went on numerous trips to destinations in Africa and Asia from rainforest to snow-covered mountains to take portraits of a selection of some of the world's most charismatic primates. And I'll introduce you to them now. The Mandrill from Gabon in Central Africa, the lion-tailed macaque from India, the world's best-dressed monkey, the red shank duck from Vietnam, from Borneo, the orangutan, the Colossus monkey, the black crested macaque on Sulawesi, and then three species that are adapted to extremely cold environments. Here, the Japanese macaque, also known as snow monkey, and two species in China, the golden snub nosed monkey, and the black and white snub nosed monkey. So those were the species I've been photographing. Now let me take you to the field and talk a little about how it actually works when I'm out there photographing monkeys. So normally I spend between one week and two weeks photographing each species. And I spend many hours every day in their company, just taking thousands and thousands of portraits of them, trying to capture those special moments and special expressions. And when I'm photographing monkeys, it always takes place on their terms. I follow their rhythm. And what that is, is different from species to species. Here's an example of the black crested macaques from Sulawesi. So they spend several hours every day slowly walking through the monsoon forest looking for fruits and other foods. And so when they walk, I walk with them. And when they settle down to groom, or to rest, I sit down next to them, and that's when I really get to work. That's when I start taking their 
or trace. This here is the alpha male of the troop, always with this grim look on his face. And there's a scientific study that has shown that the black crested macaque actually has more facial expressions than any other macaque, and some of them are hilarious. The most endearing facial expression of this species, though, is its smile. So when it shows teeth like that, it's actually a smile. They smile uh, with the same purpose that we humans would smile, which is to show that it has friendly intentions. Let me just show you a video of that. So when I photograph monkeys that move around on the ground, I always sit on the ground with my camera on the tripod, uh, very low to the ground to get down to that uh, eye to eye level. And almost on a daily basis, when I was photographing these black crested macaques, sub adults, especially males, would walk straight up to me and look themselves in the mirror, look at their study, their own reflection in the front of my big camera lens. They actually they absolutely love looking themselves in the mirror. How it works. So now look at the individual to the right, sees me, gets eye contact, makes kissing noises with its lips, and then it smiles at me. And again, that's to show that we're good buddies here. So one day I've been sitting on the ground for a while and I just needed to get up and stretch my legs. So I took a, a few steps away from my camera and then this happened. Another sub adult came over and started handing my camera to like a professional little wildlife photographer. I don't know if it's looking at its own reflection or if it's someone trying to imitate me, but it really goes to show how incredibly inquisitive and intelligent they are. So speaking of intelligence, that's the one thing that you can't help noticing when you spend time with monkeys, how incredibly clever they are. And I love capturing them when they sit in postures similar to Wudang's famous sculpture, The Thinker. Because to me, it somehow symbolizes this uh, intelligence of theirs. And when they pose like this, it's hard not to get the impression that there's a lot going on behind those observant eyes, whatever that may be. So as a wildlife portrait photographer, the thing that uh, I find most intriguing about the monkeys though are all of their facial expressions. Now if you look into the, sign, uh, the science of this subject and there's actually an interesting story behind it. So mammals are the only animals ever to evolve facial, uh, facial muscles with a specific purpose of making facial expressions as an extra level of their communication. Uh, these highly specialized muscles are called facial expression muscles or mimetic muscles. And you find them in many different mammals. Just think about dogs, how expressive they can be. But the group of animals where you have the most sophisticated facial expression muscles and the richest repertoire of facial expressions, that is by far the primates, the higher monkeys and the great apes. And what you can see on the illustration to the right is where these mimetic muscles are situated. The socially advanced monkeys and the great apes, they have the same number, more or less, of facial expression muscles as we humans do. And what's interesting is that they're situated in exactly the same main areas as in us. So that's around the eyes and in the region of the nose and the mouth. And that's why so many of the facial expressions of the primates are very similar to what we're used to seeing in other humans. As their emotions change, their facial expressions change all the time. It goes so quick. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of that. This here is a young orangutan. And now I'm going to show you a series of four portraits that I've taken within only two seconds. You just notice how much the face changes. The orangutans have these really soft lips, and they use them a lot for their facial expressions. 
And then here you've got the snow monkey, the Japanese macaque. And just notice how the macaques, they use their eyebrows a lot for their facial expressions, very movable eyebrows. And it totally changes the face. And then the mandrill that uses uh, especially movements around that big muscle it has. There are a series of four portraits taken within a few minutes just also to show how the facial expression is always changing. And then finally, the proboscis monkey, a young bachelor. Notice how monkeys, when they're sitting there, and they're always watching each other, just like we humans are always watching other humans, always observing. And here are a series of four portraits taken of that young individual, again, within a few minutes. So this young male, this bachelor, is the most tranquil, laid back, peaceful, serene monkey individual I've ever photographed. And that brings me to one of the most interesting lessons that I've gotten out of photographing all of these primates, which is that not only does each species have its own characteristic, each individual has its own personality. Recently, I found this quote by Jen Goodall, and she says, you cannot share your life with a dog or a cat and not know perfectly well that animals have personalities and minds and feelings. And that's spot on what I try to capture with my animal portraits. And it's also why it is that I'm so fascinated by wildlife portraits as opposed to other types of wildlife photography, because when you get so close to an animal that you can look it in the eyes and see its facial expression and get an impression of its emotional state, that's when you see the personality and that's when you get a, if you will, a look into its soul. So that's why to me, wildlife portraits is photographically the ultimate way of getting really close to these animals and truly seeing them for what they are. So many of my pictures have been published in magazines and newspapers in various countries, but the place where my photos get the most exposure is actually on Instagram. So Instagram is a great place for photographers in general, but it turns out because most people, they look at Instagram on their phones where pictures are relatively small. It turns out that wildlife portraits with engaging facial expressions is actually perfect for this media. And I get a lot of positive response from my wildlife portraits, especially the ones of primates. I'm sure it's because so many of their expressions look like humans. And this here is uh, one of the examples, uh, Red Shang Duk posing with closed eyes, looking almost like it's meditating. I've called this picture the Sen monkey. And this image here was sort of my breakthrough, if you will, on Instagram because as a result of sharing this photo, I went from around 20,000 followers to more than 100,000 followers on Instagram. So Instagram has become this amazing platform to me to actually spread awareness to reach a huge worldwide audience. And it's something that I take quite serious. And that brings me to uh, the last point of my talk here, something that I also alluded to in the title of the talk, which is the thing about fusing wildlife photography and science communication. So actually, when I share my photos, I actually do a lot of science communication too. I don't want people just to see pretty photos. I also want them to learn something about these animals. And I always or mostly accompany my photos with the science-based stories about their adaptations, their interesting behaviors, their evolution. In this case here, the Jalala, I talk about how it uses its red chest mark. And the reason why I do this is that I think there's a huge potential in exactly this fusion of engaging wildlife photographs and interesting scientific facts. When people, they learn more about these animals, they can develop a deeper appreciation for them. And it's a great way of making people more 
enthusiastic, more fascinated with these animals and also making people care more. And in these day, this day and age where more and more animals are threatened and that goes, especially for the primates, it's so important to educate people and to make them care more about the animals. So that was my presentation. Thanks a lot, Moons. It was really, really interesting, fascinating pictures and, and stories. I'm sure everyone loved it. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, either type X or raise your hands, please, uh, or type the questions in the chat box and uh, I'll be happy to read them out loud. Or again, if you want to stay anonymous, uh, just send directly to me or Moons and then we'll read them out loud. So please go ahead if you have any questions. Oh, should I have one in there? Can I ask it? Of course. Of course. Hi, Moans. Thanks. That, that was awesome. I, I apologize. I missed the first four minutes. So I hope my question isn't uh, redundant in that. But uh, um, so how do you actually fund all your monkey travels? I mean, you're doing a lot of traveling, right? And taking a lot of time out. Is, I mean, uh, is it just purely self-funded or it, yeah. do you get contracted yeah. to do stuff or grants? It's or, self funded. Or, it's all self-funded? Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, and and that's okay. Well, the second part of the question then is though, uh, how is it with regards to permissions? So you know where we are, we're obsessed with. Well, we spend our whole time these days working on permissions, right? Permissions <laughs> to plant and do whatever. Is photography an easy world where you just go and take photos, or or do you have to you know put a lot of effort into upfront permits and this and that? I mean, there's so many tourists now that travel around with big camera gear. So it's easy for me just to you know, be one of them. So to be honest, I don't usually apply for a special permit. You know, it's different if you're the BBC or a big company or you bring a big uh, you know, team, a lot of equipment, then obviously you need permissions and that varies a little from place to place, country to country, how strict they are. But uh, I just go as a tourist basically. But then, you're getting up extremely close to them, right? So there aren't like rangers or whatever suddenly like, what are you doing? Manhandling my monkeys or <laughs> so I do a lot of research as preparation for these trips to find the, you know, first I figure out what animals I want to photograph, but I also need to find out exactly where to go. So for example, with monkeys in areas where they're being hunted, as soon as they see you, you know, hundred meters away or more, they're gonna take off. So I need to find places where they are habituated and they're not afraid of humans. And so for example, with the black crested macaque, that's a place where uh, biologists have been studying them for many years. And they're also used to seeing photographers. So they're not afraid of humans. They don't consider humans something to worry about. So, so those are the kind of places that I always try to find. And yeah, I'm, I don't walk into the jungle by myself. I'm always accompanied by a local guide who has the, the expertise and can help me find the, the animals that I want to photograph. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, Morten Melko has a question, please. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, it was, yeah, hi, hi Mons. Uh, great to hear your talk and see your pictures. Um, you know, I was wondering, uh, we, we've had some very good experience with uh, including Carsten Evang, who is also a photographer uh, and has the sort of same background as you uh, in a project on the Greenland sled dog. And interestingly enough, uh, we were also hunting for the soul of the sled dog as you are hunting for the soul of the monkeys. Uh, and I was just wondering, you know, that this approach uh, uh, you have, um, maybe it would also be uh, interesting to fuse your work with, with um, you know, scientists doing behavioral work or other types of monkey studies. Uh, we, we have had really good, you know, um, uh, really good uh, experiences with fusing many different fields, both photography, film making, uh, school book making, uh, science making, you know, for both high profile uh, things and also for writing books and so on. And it's so much more rewarding to, to be together with, with the both sort of uh, communicators like yourself, uh, as well as with the scientists and school teachers in the group. Uh, as Tom says, it's, it's just a problem with the financing of these things because very few foundations are sort of willing to, to provide funding for these very broad 
focused projects. But I think really that some of these projects may be the future for our research. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it would definitely be interesting to have this kind of contact with researchers on the ground, for example, doing research with these uh, monkeys. And that's something I hope to be able to do in the future, because it's also something that allows me maybe to access some uh, monkeys that I wouldn't be able to get to uh, other ways. So yeah, I'm very open to such collaborations. But like I said, I think this, this combination, I mean, what I've sometimes done is when I've contacted researchers, as I say, you know, I, I'll be able to go out with you and photograph your monkeys. And in return, I'll give you access to my pictures. You can use it for your homepage, for your funding applications, for your general public engagement projects. So I think there is, a, like in the example with Carsten, I think there's a great synergy between wildlife photographer, uh, photographers and, and science communication. And science. And science, yeah. Tom, go ahead, please. Yeah, Moses, can I ask another possibly very naive question? But uh, um, with with regards to technology and cameras, because if people want to do this, right, I mean, uh, are there cameras these days extremely, extremely expensive, or is it basically after a while they plateau and you get you spend more and more, but the quality doesn't get better? I mean, uh, I guess you can't do this kind of stuff on an iPhone, right? But but given the way cameras have changed in recent decades what's the sort of required technology to do a lot of this and how much realistically would it be for people who might want to start taking serious pictures? I often get asked by sort of uh, young up and coming photographers what equipment I would recommend them to buy. And I mean, it is with camera equipment like it is with a lot of other things that you get what you pay for. And if you want the top notch equipment where you can get like really sharp images like the ones I want to take, the equipment is very expensive. I mean, there are some new lenses that came out from Canon now. They cost more than 100,000 kroner here in Denmark just for one lens. So it's ridiculous. Uh, you can get cheaper versions, cheaper models, and they will still now be really high quality. So I would always recommend you to, to begin with sort of more modest equipment. And you, can, and you can still, because the development is so fast, like you say, and still get a really decent quality but if you want the top-notch sharpness and dynamic range and all that you need to go go up and uh, and invest in, in really expensive equipment so if i can ask the second part to my question then mm -hmm. I, I love uh, your video of the monkey manhandling your camera but that would have uh, given me a heart attack if you've got that expensive <laughs> <laughs> so how does one deal with them getting their grubby little fingers all over your very very fancy <laughs> well i will say actually normally this is sort of an aberration normally i never have this kind of contact with the monkeys it's not something i look for i prefer just to leave them alone and leave them be and and not get this contact, but the black crest and macaques are just so curious. So what I do in that situation is I read sort of their energy, just like you would with kids, I suppose. And I just had the feeling that this youngster here was relatively calm and it's moving, so I wasn't too worried about it. You know, sometimes you can see that they're a lot more sort of energetic or, or wild. And in that case, I would probably go over and, and take my gear. Thanks. But I mean, a lot about uh, also this, photographing animals at close range, a lot of that is about reading their signals really, uh, to see if they allow you to be close to them, if they're fine with you being there. Uh, so a lot of uh, you know, what allows me to take these kind of photos is reading the animals and, and seeing their signals. Thanks. We have another question in the chat, so I'll just read it out loud. Uh, thank you for your talk. What do you think should be prioritized at the beginning of a career as a nature photographer? Gear, technical knowledge, or traveling in interesting places? <laughs> I think both. I mean, to me, photography is just like a lot of other crafts. You know, if you want to be a really good football player or musician, you just need to put in a lot of hard work. You need to train for many years to reach a high level. So I think the most important thing is not necessarily buying the very expensive equipment from the get-go, but just go out and photograph a lot, get a lot of experiences, because there's so many levels to photography. It's about training your eye to see uh, the motives. It's about thinking about all these details that other people don't notice when you take an image, like the background and the light and the posture and all these things. 
And you only learn that from practicing a lot. So I would just say, go out there, travel as much as you can, photograph as much as you can, and then just have patience and let it develop. Thanks, Mons. I have another one. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering more technical things, you know, like for example, before, of course, the pandemic times, how much time you would spend outside Denmark or like in the, in the rainforest and how much after work, work is being done, you know, when you come back to Denmark, like how things happen, like what, what you spend your time on afterwards, is it like uh, how exactly you communicate and all these things in a bit more detail. So since I work at the Natural History Museum, I have my permanent job there. I get six weeks of vacation per year. So I typically do one long trip during the summer vacation. And then I also travel over a shorter trip over Christmas. So I'm away <laughs> in non-COVID uh, times, typically six weeks uh, a year and do two or three trips. Uh, I'm sure that I spent quite a bit more time actually working with my images at home than I do being in the field. So most days and also during weekends, you know, working with my images, going through the images, uh, selecting images, working with them and sharing them over various platforms. So that's sort of a, that's also part of how you train yourself as a photographer is constantly looking at your results so you can learn from them and take the next step. Cool. And uh, I have another one if nobody else uh, wants to interrupt me. Uh, I was wondering, for example, uh, the cool, coolest pictures that you have, the award-winning ones, for example, is it, were you expecting that sort of, uh, you know, uh, angle and everything, or things just come up randomly sometimes and you, I mean, you have taken them and then it turns out to be a cool thing, or there's a lot of things that you sort of were waiting for that specific moment to come, I mean, how these things work? So you often hear, and I'm sure you've heard that too, about these wildlife photographers. Uh, they sit back home and they have this vision, they have this idea for an image, and they spend years chasing that particular image, finding themselves in that particular situation. And that's great when you can do that. I never work like that. Like I said, it's all uh, on the terms of the monkey. So I go there and I spend time with them and I see what happens. I see what they do and I sort of appreciate what whatever they give me, whatever expressions, whatever situations occur when I'm out there. So to me, it's very much about being around the primates in this case, observing them, getting to know them, getting better at reading their signals, predicting their behavior, predicting their interesting facial expressions, and then just see what happens. And you also sort of started to understand their, I guess, uh, what they mean, right? Sort of their language. Yeah. 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 So again, each species is different. They have different temperament. They have different energies, if you will. But there is also a lot of similarities across the board, you know, between the, the different primates and also between different animals. Uh, so yeah, you know, these experiences that I have from other monkeys, when I go and photograph a new monkey, I can use a lot of that. And then they're also going to do something completely unexpected, which is really fun. Just uh, there are a few questions in the chat, but I'll just uh, continue maybe with my small question. I, I was wondering, is there like any evolutionary behavioral studies, for example, like conserved uh, facial expressions, whatever across monkey lineages, and some of them are, as you said, specific to specific lineages or species, and some are different. Like, are there any kind of uh, studies like that, more behavioral biology, evolutionary things like that? I don't know. There's quite a few studies that I'll be happy to share uh, references with if you're interested, where they look into the evolution of the facial expression muscles and they compare it between, you know, different uh, mammal groups and also look at different species of, of primates. So one of the interesting parts, for example, is that in the species that have very colorful faces, you tend to have fewer mm. expressions, but with the um, the primates and monkeys that have a more bland face, like the black face of the black crested macaque, or just sort of a skin colored face, they have, because they don't have the colors to show off with, they have evolved a lot more facial expressions. Mm. Cool, interesting. Uh, okay, Tom has a question in the chat. Uh, do you think that COVID will have an effect on this kind of work with regards to reduced tourism, meaning reduced familiarity to the monkeys with the tourists, thus behavioral changes? Uh, that's a tough question. 
I know they're talking about in a lot of areas like national parks in Africa and reserves around the world that they're actually suffering a lot because an important part of their income is from ecotourism. And so now they can't afford to pay rangers and stuff like that. So they see an increase in poaching, snaring, things like that. Uh, so yeah, I guess maybe in some, in some places, uh, if they're not seeing so many tourists now, they might change their behavior a little bit. But once you see tourism again, I think it's going to go back to the way it was in, in most places. So we'll see. I mean, it's hard to predict what the world is going to uh, look like once we go back to more or less normal conditions. Uh, Anas Hansen has a question. Anas, please go ahead. Thank you, Mons. Uh, thank you for, <clears throat> for giving this nice talk and attending our science and art, uh, what we call a uh, uh, round of speakers. Um, you talked about uh, uh, going out to the field and spending time. So how much time are we talking about? Right? To, to get pictures like that and you say uh, to, to get to the level of intimacy uh, with these animal uh, animals, is, is this... I guess it's not just, okay, I'll take a weekend off and then go and take these pictures and go back and put them on the wall on Instagram and, and then I get famous, right? And we're talking about something completely different, uh, a commitment that, 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 that that's requires a lifelong interest or drive. Or how, how is it? Yeah, so I've probably taken, you know, with, when you include not just the monkeys, but are there uh, mammal species that I've taken portraits of over the years? I've taken probably more than 100,000 portraits of animals, just to give you an idea. So it takes a lot of work uh, and a lot of time to sort of develop your eye for all these details. Uh, and I guess I'm sure that's the case for any kind of wildlife photography that you need to work for several years and you need to improve your skills and you need to train your eye to see all of these little details. And then once you're in the field, you can apply that. Uh, so just to give you an example, um, for example, the, the uh, proboscis monkey, the bachelor, the one sitting in with the closed eyes, uh, he sat in front of me for about five minutes and I took about 200 portraits of him. And one of these portraits, he was sitting in perfect profile and I knew that was a special moment. But because they're moving all the time and their facial expressions change all the time, there's a lot of things going on that I don't see because uh, a lot of these expressions, they only last for split seconds. But I know when something interesting is happening with their face and then I just shoot my, my series and then you know, I'll catch something. So I, um, with this camera I have now, it shoots 12 frames per second. And I take these series and typically it's only one of the frames in series with 12 frames per second. One of the images, that's where you get the interesting expression. So, so yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of photos and, uh, and then you see what happens. All right. And I guess there's also quite a lot of, uh, when you spend like a week out, then you need two weeks uh, editing or looking at photos or some out of some sort of uh, uh, also fraction or, or way to divide that uh, amount of time you need to put in it. Yeah, so, so like I said in my talk, I typically spend uh, between one and two weeks with the primate that I photograph. And yeah, and then I spend the rest of my home time, you know, almost daily looking at my photos, working with my photos and sharing them. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there's a question in the, in the chat. I'll read it out loud. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk and photos. As an amateur photographer, I'm very jealous. A couple of curiosities. I was the, uh, what was the most difficult place to photograph? What was the most interesting? And uh, did you have any dangerous episode with any animal? <laughs> So the most difficult animal to get to was the mandrill because it lives in Gabon. And Gabon is a very undeveloped place when it comes to tourism. So it took me several years to figure out how actually to organize the trip so I could get close to the mandrill and, and photograph it in the wild. Um, and what was the second question? There was a question about if it's dangerous. And that's a question I get very often. 
Uh, and maybe it's an obvious question because I'm so close to a lot of animals. I will say though that when I photograph, uh, say, lions and tigers, I'm sitting in a vehicle, so that's a different situation. I wouldn't necessarily walk up to a tiger and sit next to it. Uh, with the primates, I've had a few situations where primates have uh, sort of either you know hissed at me or made mock charges at me, and then I just back away. And as soon as they see that I respect them and I give them the space that they want, then that's typically the end of the situation. So I've never been attacked or bitten or anything by, by the monkeys. But like I said, an important part of this and something that I've had to learn over the years is to read the signals that they send you. And once you learn that, and that's something you learn by observing them and being around them, that very often that goes for monkeys and it goes for other animals as well. They will tell you if they are okay with you being close to them. If they're not, they're going to let you know. And then I always sort of respect them and, and back away. So the kind of situation that I take most of my poetry in is situations where they allow me into their bubble, so to speak. They allow me to sit close to them and they totally don't care about me. That's actually what I prefer. I want them to ignore me because that's when I can start taking interesting portraits. I want them to interact with each other and do whatever it is that they do without thinking about me. Thanks, Mons. I have another one. Uh, do you miss, I mean, science? Because before the photography phase of your life, I would say the science, and I mean, I think you did a lot of uh, novel things, right? With the, with the camera traps and all these things. And it, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, to miss that part and then like a second part of that question what exactly made you switch basically careers I'm guessing the photo trapping of course was a major part because that that's how I guess gradually changed but like what was specifically was there a specific thing or it was gradually changing or so I will say sometimes when I go into you know an interesting forest or other wilderness areas, I kind of miss those days where I would fill my backpack with camera traps and just walk out there. This challenge of finding the right places to set up your camera traps, sort of read the landscape, try to predict the movements of the animals, and then seeing the results and seeing all of these animals that you rarely get to to see actually see them on photos. Uh, yeah, I, I miss that sometimes. Um, but I'm really happy with the choice that I made. You know, I don't look back and have any regrets about it. I actually love my job now at the Natural History Museum where I get to work with people like you. I do a lot of work with the researchers organizing talks and other kinds of science events. And I love this thing about creating the frame where researchers like yourself can present their science to, to the public. So I appreciate very much being in close connection with the science world, but I don't miss being a researcher myself, it was a wise choice that I made. Uh, and I think back then, the reason why I made that choice is that, you know, I had a, a lot of great adventures in South America, but I also reached a point where I felt that I, I didn't want to do this for the rest of my life, you know, sitting in a muddy field station in the middle of, of the Amazon. It gets old after a couple of years. Uh, and rather than going home, and back then there wasn't interesting places like a uh, globe and, and such places, so go home and try to become a biologist in Denmark instead, it didn't really appeal to me. Uh, and I had many years of experience with public engagement, I really loved that. So to me, it was an obvious choice to go all in and say, okay, now I'm going to switch over and work with the full time with science communication. Cool. Yeah, thanks. And uh, uh, just just another one. Uh, do do you plan? Uh, of course, if it's not, of course, confidential or something. But uh, so, do you plan to, with with the with the apes for what, for photographs, or are you planning to sort of change the angle, or uh, you know, switch the angle of maybe different mammals or different uh, directions, just for the diversity, maybe or something? I don't know. I think I'm for sure not done with the primates. But there are also other mammals that really attract me in places that attract me. So, um, you know, I have a, a short list of primates that I'd love to photograph. For example, the bonobo and the drill, which is sort of the black cousin of the mandrill, uh, and various other species that I love to photograph. They're still kind of 
you know, still trying to figure out how to organize trips here to, to get close to them. Uh, but there are also other animals uh, that I'd love to, um, to photograph. So we'll see, we'll see what happens where, uh, where these trips take me. Maybe gorillas? I've done gorillas. I love gorillas. Um, yeah, who knows? <laughs> uh, Tom has a question. Please go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Mons. Yeah, sorry for, uh, I, I don't often get to ask you many questions. It's normally the other way around with Wiener Wimscape. Um, <laughs> so has, has your work been recognized either in a good or bad way by the governments or authorities of the local countries you're taking the photos at? I mean, basically, do you take photos in Africa or Asia and then the West sees them and that's it? Or, I mean, do you ever get feedback from those? Because I know you say how it can be useful in conservation this, but but what is the actual formal feedback, if any, you get from them? Are they appreciative or not? Or uh, I haven't received any like official feedback from any countries or any authorities like that. Uh, I'm in touch with uh, many NGOs working with these monkeys in the field. Uh, I communicate with them, but but um, yeah, I mean, obviously that is the big challenge. And we're talking about wildlife photography and conservation that it's not enough just to take beautiful photos of animals that make people care about them you also actually need to make the changes in the local areas where these animals uh, live and and how do you go about that it's a huge project every time so i think wildlife photographs can definitely support this effort but it's not enough i mean the real work takes place on the ground. And that's something I hope to be able to do more in the future, actually support some of these conservation projects with my with my uh, images. Thanks. We have a question for from Bella in the chat. I'll read it out loud. Thanks for uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Have you had any problems with the locals in those remote regions where you capture the photos? Never, on the contrary. I mean, to me, that's I, I always love travel, uh, traveling. I've traveled uh, for many years since I was a, a young man. And a big part of uh, what I enjoy about traveling is meeting locals wherever I, I go. And I always really uh, enjoy hanging out with the local guides and the local people, you know, the rangers and, and field assistants, whatever I, I meet when I'm out there. Uh, and I try to learn as much as I can from them because I remember when I was photographing the black crested macaques, there's this guy out there, a field assistant. He's been following these guys around for 10 years, every day from sunrise to sunset. And he's got so much knowledge that the researchers don't do because he spent so much time with them. So, so no, I never had any bad experience with the locals on, on the country. That's a big part of what I enjoy about traveling. Thanks, Mont. Uh, Morten Melko has has a question. Please go ahead, Morten. Well, it's a, maybe a, a little comment because uh, our experience with the dog project is that, that uh, the pictures have been taken to heart by the politicians and by everybody in Greenland. And it's actually so that the, some of the big pictures are used as background for press meetings at the parliament and things like that. So, you know, you might be able to use some of your your pictures uh, you know for that type of uh, communication with also the government of the countries you work in because I, you know many times people are really really proud of of what they have but they don't have the the images perhaps that, mm -hmm. that would show it so maybe mm -hmm. you could consider that yeah yeah that's a nice experience uh I have another maybe silly question, but uh, uh, is there a lot of competition among photographers? I mean, is it a big community, for example, photographers uh, taking pictures of, for example, apes, let's say orangutans. I mean, there is a not, not a lot of places in the world, as you say, like pristine and where they're not afraid of humans. So it's getting, mm -hmm. unfortunately, smaller and smaller. So are there a lot of, for example, photographers, maybe, as you said, maybe even in these recent years with Instagram, maybe there is even more and more photographers are trying to, you know, take cool pictures. Is it, is it a problem or is it a, a I don't know. Well, it, it depends on the way you look at it. I mean, when it comes to spreading awareness about all of these animals and reading, uh, reaching a lot of people, I think it's a positive thing. 
that there are so many photographers out there. It's easier than ever before to travel. And more and more people can actually afford decent camera equipment so they can really zoom into the animals. Uh, but obviously when it comes to being able to live professionally as a wildlife photographer, I think anyone in the game agrees that it's become very, very difficult. I think only quite a few people can live solely on being wildlife photographers. You have to sort of combine it with a lot of other things. And that is uh, to a large degree because of the, the competition. Hmm. So it is a problem. Uh, Tom has a question. Yeah, it's a very important one, Moans, for you. It's the one we're all burning to ask. You clearly must have one of the monkeys tattooed onto your chest or back. I mean, what, you know, you, so <laughs> we, you must have a tattoo of one of them. Which one? I actually don't. Oh, Moan. <laughs> they, they tell me to lie anyway. <laughs> no, no. Oh, okay. But actually, I will say that this guy sent me this incredible tattoo work that he had done on his uh, legs. And the centerpiece of that was one of one of my golden snub-nosed monkeys. And that look amazing, you know, with all the colors. So yeah, there's a, there's a few tattoos out there uh, of some of my photos, which is really a, a, a lot of fun. I'm glad to hear it. But I'll be happy to donate one of my photos if you want a monkey tattoo, Tom. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I guess there are no more questions. So uh, thanks a lot, Moons, for the wonderful talk, guys. beautiful pictures, and really interesting discussion. And uh, thanks again from yeah on behalf of everyone, I guess. And uh, yeah, we appreciate Thank you, it. Thanks and goodbye.